the northern suburb of Aleppo. June 2015. These men playing a pickup soccer game belong to Ansar al Aqida, a very influential component of the jihadist rebellion in the north of Syria. These are the men we will follow for over a week. None of this would have been possible but for this man, Abu Muhammad al Halapi. This 40 something with beard and glasses created the faction around one year ago. Before that, he was the undisputed leader in the north of Jabhat al-Nusra, a Salafist group affiliated to al-Qaeda. A warlord with a bloodthirsty reputation, he is always in command, even here, when it comes to putting the ball in the opposition goal. According to several American sources, he was shot dead in a raid in 2012. As if by miracle, he lives again. Here in this Aleppo school, partly destroyed by the regime's bombing, the chief of Ansar al aqida the followers of faith, established his headquarters some months ago. Commander and religious leader, this is the image he likes to put across. Every day, the same ritual. From 8 o'clock in the morning, Abu Muhammad and his men take lessons in the Achem, an extreme reading of the Quran. The education is provided by one of their eminence Gris, himself a jihadi veteran. <laughs> Religion and war, the two fundamentals of Abu Muhammad. He even wanted to appear in traditional Mujahideen costume at work in his office. It seems that the man is extremely distrustful towards journalists, as he soon reminds us. So why us? We met Abu Muhammad in 2012 in Aleppo at the beginning of the war and we forged a bond of trust. We maintained contact since then and a few months ago asked if we could follow him for a week. He agreed because he wants to show who these combatants are and explain why they are fighting. Throughout this shoot we must follow the rules he will lay down. The daily fear of the war we are about to experience is firstly the bombing. Just four years ago, Aleppo was the economic lungs of Syria. Now more than half the city lies in ruins. The threat here almost always comes from the sky. Barrels of oil or gas cylinders loaded with powerful explosives, and sometimes also scrap metal and combustibles, whose use is prohibited by the Geneva Convention. A bomb has just fallen in this neighborhood, now under jihadist control, but where many civilians live. Amnesty International says that over 3,000 people paid for the army's untimely drops with their lives, and that was just in 2014. The regime continues to deny using these lethal weapons, claiming they're only targeting the rebels. Here, there's only material damage. <laughs> Ja, 
سموك اهل الله ما هو متي سوريا متي سوريا ما بي تبون تبون الطيارة Barely have we arrived than there's another alert in an adjoining neighborhood. This time it's a regime helicopter come to discharge several barrels in the Sukari sector. Casualties are heavy. Four people killed outright, two of them children. Although 500 meters from the impact, this man's body was cut in two by the barrel's shrapnel. The scene we've just witnessed can be repeated up to 15 times a day, depending on the frequency of army raids. In this neighborhood of Aleppo, as in many others, intensive bombing inevitably favors the jihadist cause. One of Abu Muhammad's men has invited us to his wedding. Two hours to drive barely 30 kilometers. The many checkpoints and the state of the road are to blame. The groom, 23, is wearing his best suit. The context is never entirely forgotten. The wedding song includes a direct attack on Bashar al-Assad. As is traditional, men and women celebrate separately. The scene is surrealistic. These men are all combatants. Outside, the war goes on. The firing, at first thought to be joyful, in fact comes from a helicopter overflying the sector. We leave the barn to try to film the source of so much controversy, the helicopters that the regime is so desperate to hide. Spotting them is very risky and not at all easy. It is they who drop the barrels of death, here shown in slow motion. The first drop. And a second soon after, more than one kilometer away. Though quickly on the scene, the men from civil protection can only survey the damage.
Three men have just lost their lives, buried under the rubble of their house. This one was caught in the trap. The civil protection men don't manage to revive him. It's the end of our first day in Syria. The following morning in Idlib, 80 kilometers southwest of Aleppo. In a discreet mosque, an 11-year-old is reciting verses from the Quran, inciting Muslims to wage holy war. This young boy is the son of the man in the red and white kefia. His name is Abu Tawfiq, one of the most important warlords in the region. A jihad veteran, he learned his trade in Afghanistan, in Chechnya, and in the Balkans. Today, Abu Tawfiq's stronghold hosts a highly important meeting attended by all the chiefs of jihadist factions in the region. The heads of numerous groups that operate between Aleppo and Latakia all have the same objective, to establish Sharia law in an Islamic caliphate. High on the War Council's agenda is the question, who will lead the next offensives on the various fronts? Abu Tawfiq puts pressure on his men. Abu Muhammad, our guide, is also present. Uh, Sitting by them is a man who refuses to be filmed. He has a reason for that. There's a price on his head. Abu Muad El Masri, alias Abu Muaz, is an Egyptian with an impressive pedigree. Wanted by the US State Department, captured in 2009 by the CIA in Afghanistan, and extradited to the USA and then Egypt, he was then released following the revolution that brought an end to Mubarak's reign. The meeting ends. As well as being a feared warlord, Abu Tawfiq is also a political strategist. He never questions the influence of the Islamic State in Syria. <laughs> We are about to see for ourselves the determination of these men in the field. <laughs> he 
Here, Abu Tawfiq's combatants and other jihadists are leaving to attack a position held by soldiers faithful to the regime. In this case, Alawite militiamen. In this village, just 30 kilometers from Latakia, neither side will yield a meter to the other. Scenes of unbelievable guerrilla violence. We soon find ourselves trapped amidst the bursts of gunfire from automatic weapons. One meter away from us, a bullet has just ricocheted into this man's mouth. Without medical assistance, he dies before nightfall. We take advantage of the short respite to slip away. The fighting continues and becomes even fiercer. As for the village, it finally falls several days later. At the wheel of a pickup, Abu Muhammad agrees to take us to a secret place in Aleppo where no camera has ever been before. At first glance, this looks like an ordinary mechanical workshop. But this is where the Ansar al-Aqida group and other factions jihadists daily produce explosives, bombs and munitions. The man on the left with the red beard is called Abu Layef. He's the chief of a brigade close to Ansar al-Aqida, the group led by our guide since this report began. From dawn till dusk, these jihadists make grenades. as well as bombs, and shells. In this room, gas cylinders are prepped for fitting with explosive charges. <laughs> Each bottle is painstakingly cleaned out with sand to get rid of the gas. Wow. 
then filled with powder. The bomb makers are equipped with smock and mask, precautions bordering on the ridiculous. Where do these weapons come from? Who finances them? There's no way of knowing. The technicians take a break for our camera. But the reality is rather different. The man on the right is a Syrian prisoner sentenced to death by the jihadis. Far from an isolated case. This entire war arsenal might seem somewhat homemade. But a trip to the front line is enough to see that they enable the jihadists to do a lot of damage to the enemy. We go with Abu Muhammad close to the port of Latakia, one of the most disputed front lines in recent months. Here, several jihadist factions have joined forces in a combined attempt to bring down Syria's fourth city, through which Damascus gets fresh supplies of weapons and essential goods. This combatant, barely 13, has just come too close to one of the guns that has just been used. Abu Mohammed and Abu Layef meet to coordinate operations. On the opposite slope, less than 500 meters away, a Shiite unit is given jihadists cold sweats. <coughs> The interview is interrupted by fighting. Allahu Akbar! Abu Layef decides to break cover in a bid to assess the enemy positions and rectify the aim of his guns. He is then joined by one of his men. It's an ideal position from which to assess the damage to the other side. The target has been hit. It's almost twilight. In this war of attrition, which has gone on for months in the Latakia sector, the jihadists have forced their enemy back a few dozen meters. <laughs> 
These men praying together have all been sentenced to death. As with Islamic State, in the zones they control, the jihadis have their own courts and their own prisons. This one, located in a southern neighborhood of Aleppo, boasts around 50 inmates. Soldiers captured in combat, deserters from the regime, and sometimes civilians suspected by the jihadis of espionage. Before being brought before the Islamic Commission, prisoners have an initial hearing in this office. This man is a deserter. By asking these questions, the jihadist is trying to learn as much as possible about the other side. In this war, as in others, intelligence can be the key to victory. The interrogation is over. In the office next door, a civilian presides over the court. His knowledge of Muslim law, in other words, the Quranic texts that govern the application of Sharia, made him the ideal man for the job. A simple poster is a reminder of the severity of the penalty. This officer of the Assad regime managed to eject when his plane was hit by a missile. The jihadists accuse him of multiple offenses of dropping barrel bombs on civilian populations. He is facing de It's impossible for us to find out the real conditions of his detention. The only escape lies in prayer, as, barring a miracle, none of these men will ever again see the light of day. In certain cases, prisoners can also be used as bargaining chips, like this man on the right, captured three months ago on the front. On the phone is his father, a major in the regular army. With him, the jihadist on the left will negotiate his son's release. Hello. Negotiation has been bogged down for weeks. So the jihadist will give him a clear ultimatum. That's when the prisoner understands he may be living his final moments. Yeah, 
يعني يترحم على ابناء لا ما لنا ما لنا طيبين ولا لنا كابر ان شاء الله لنقيم عليه الشرع وحد على الله السلام عليكم لنا قدام رب العالمين وقدامك وقدام اهلك وهي صارت تصلنا فيهم ثلاث مرات صلق اسير عنا انت اكثر من شهرين لهلا اهلك ما اتصلوا فينا ولا مره وابوك عب بكذب كذاب لو حكي مع محامي ولو شيء ومبين عليه انه مع النظام ومع الخنزير يعني سمانا بهنيك وكذا الا شوي دي قلنا انتم ارهابيين او مسلحين او كذا المهم معه من هول الاسبوع هذاك بوقتنا حرية تصرف او يتواصل معنا ترجع بتحكي معه بكره وبعد بكره والبعد لبين ما تشوف حل نحن قلنا اخوة اسرى بدنا اياه ما اجوا الاسرى انت حكمة قتلها It's a reprieve for the prisoner. But how long will that last? Since our arrival, we've been constantly surprised by the harshness of this war. We were almost as surprised by this totally unexpected slice of life. <laughs> Brothers in arms, Abu Muhammad's men are all here, paddling in the water, bathing in this river. Contrary to what you might think, swimming, laughing and having fun aren't considered as haram, as a sin. That day, Abu Muhammad decided to grant his men a few moments relaxation. <laughs> The day is coming to an end. In the Latakia sector, our guide decides to inspect a rather special building site. The foreman, sporting an Islamic State headband, is called Abu Asad. The visit begins. What we're about to see inside will take our breath away. Built early in the summer, six meters underground, this tunnel was dug to take the enemy from the rear. After two kilometers, the enemy positions are right above our heads. This colossal project is kept going by 15 Syrian prisoners working 15-hour daily shifts, night and day. <laughs> Appalling working conditions for these slaves, armed with simple pneumatic drills, who have to put up with more than 40 degree heat and a stifling atmosphere. When we questioned them, you could see the fear in their faces. <laughs> عند النظام كانوا يسبوا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم ورح نأتيهم بإذن الله ورح نعمل فيهم تفجير عملية استشهادية بعون الله تعالى إذا ما عم نقدر نجيهم فوق الأرض إن شاء الله من تحت الأرض نكون تحتهم وبإذن الله رح نذبحهم واحد واحد للكفرة 
In this tactical war, where each side tries to catch the other unawares, this shows that the jihadists are ready for anything. In the bowels of the earth, Abu Asad takes advantage of the presence of foreign journalists to challenge us on a subject dear to his heart. He is one of the few in the group to speak openly of France as an enemy. At the time of our visit, the prisoners had already dug close to four kilometers of tunnels. The ultimate target was five. Almost one week at the heart of the jihad, and our amazement continued to grow. Just months ago, this zone was controlled by Islamic State. But its men were routed by other combatants, in particular the Free Syrian Army. We had heard that some Christians remained in the sector. We brought this up with our guides, and they brought us here to the village of Al Qunaya. Built in 1933, its church is still standing. It's even regularly attended by 230 Christian families from three neighboring villages. For the past 15 years, Father Francis, an Italian, has officiated here. Recent events have changed nothing, even when the zone was held by Islamic State. No, no. Hanno detto che noi possiamo fare tutte le funzioni nostre liturgiche, le nostre preghiere senza nessun problema, basta che non sogniamo le campane, dobbiamo togliere tutti i nostri segni religiosi che si trovano fuori, tutte le, stu le statue, abbiamo tolto la statua della Madonna, di San Giuseppe, di Santo Antonio e poi anche le croci, che non possono vedere neanche croci, perché sono segni cristiani, le abbiamo tolti e così via. The visit continues, still accompanied by the jihadists. Abu Layef and Abu Muhammad sit down alongside the priest and are very attentive to our interview. It's hard to know whether he was speaking under duress or not, but Father Francis showed an unexpected understanding of Islamic State. È una, una, una parola molto larga, una parola molto larga. Eh, la mass media gonfia le parole. Quando, quando, quando stavano qua eh, la ISIS, quando è stata qui, eh, per noi era una, una, una era eh, bella. Una era tranquilla, una era di, di, di pace, perché tutti i ladri, tutti gli assassini, tutti i mascarzoni sono scappati via. Allora potete stare tranquillo, dormire con le porte aperte. Ma veramente è stato un, un periodo molto, molto buono. E come ti ho detto prima, eravamo, eravamo di eh, rispetto reciproco. It would seem that the rules haven't changed since the arrival of Abu Muhammad's jihadists and the other factions. Even for the jizya, the mandatory tax imposed on non-Muslims, they showed quite astonishing indulgence. Our guide politely invited us to shoot the following sequence. We are back on the front line. 
In this people carrier are women and children, all armed. The jihadists made it a point of honor that we film this sequence. They are quite aware that these images are exceptional. This child, barely 12 years old and carrying a heavy weapon, struggles to pose for the camera. These women are learning to fight. Their actions are still very uncertain. The wife of Abu Muhammad, seen here on the left, has set up her own cell, Kaidat al-Jihad, the jihad base, though she is seven months pregnant. Both bomb-making and weapons handling skills are learned in a practical setting. On the sixth day of our voyage into the heart of the jihadi world, Abu Muhammad wants to show us something he feels strongly, that jihad is a family affair. He enjoys the moment playing with his nine-month-old son, though perhaps not quite the kind of games we are used to. The setting for the women's interview is carefully composed. Abu Layef's wife is here too. Stolen image of an intimacy never normally shown. But what she doesn't know is that within 48 hours, her husband will no longer be of this world. One of the challenges facing the jihadists is spotting the enemy, who are often invisible. To this end, they've invested in a new device. In fact, they have just taken delivery of several drones. One of their men has just brought them back from Europe. This device does indeed have several functions. It enables them to drop small explosive charges, but also to scrutinize the regime's positions and its aircraft. <laughs> The reconnaissance is done. Now the jihadists will temporarily abandon this part of the front as a crucial battle awaits them elsewhere. For several weeks, the jihadists have been stuck in El Furaika, a small town 70 kilometers from Latakia. The regime has pulled out all the stops, sending the Air Force on bombing raids and reinforcing numbers on the ground. This tower in the background is the problem. Inside, there are army snipers. They've devised a plan to capture it. No. 
Aleppo, in the jihadi headquarters. The bomb makers have prepared a stock of shells ready to be sent to the front. Abu Layef coordinates all operations, but we can feel that there is something special in store. The Emir reveals his strategy for capturing the tower occupied by snipers. His idea is to gain access and open fire on the enemy soldiers. And if this doesn't work, he has a plan B, to blow himself up. كيف صنعك وأنت اليوم يعني أمير هنا أنت تلبس هنا حزام ناسف ويعني سيف لي ال سيف لي الموقف بالله عليك والله يا أخي سبحان الله بس الله يعني العظيم رب العرش العظيم أن يتقبل شهدان سبحان الله والله يا أخي الحبيب الأمر اللي عم نمر فيه أمر صعب من فترة فنحن هالكفار هالقنازير عم يتمادوا على أعراضه على أرضه Faced with their chief and our camera, everyone volunteers, even the prisoner. The fateful hour draws near. Some find it hard to hold back the tears. A final prayer together. Abu Layef goes off on his own for a long while. Then comes the time for farewells. حلفتك بالله حلفتك بالله إذا قابلت رسول الله سلم عليه حلفتك بالله سلم على رسول الله يا شيخ الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر 
السلام عليكم الله معك شيخ منطقة جنة شيخ Next morning at dawn Posted at the entrance to the village, one of the jihadist factions opens fire on the enemy to create a diversion. This is the final picture of Abu Layef, less than five minutes before he enters the building where the snipers are stationed. The suicide bomber has just entered the tower. We take up position in the building opposite. Finally, he opens fire. Before being hit by a bullet himself. So Abu Layef did resort to Plan B. The way is now clear for the jihadists to advance on the tower. What we find there is a vision of horror. <laughs> Around 20 bodies lie scattered at the foot of the tower. We decide to turn off the camera. Aleppo, the final day of our tour. In the many neighborhoods that have fallen to the fundamentalists, their flag is flying almost everywhere. The first victims of this conflict that has gone on for more than four years are the children abandoned to the perils of war, the bombs and the chaos. Each day, this 10-year-old boy is doomed to wander the streets looking for food and reusable waste. The day's harvest is meager. But losing hope isn't an option. From the beginning of the revolt against the regime in March 2011, more than 220,000 people have died in Syria, one third of them civilians. 12,000 of them children. <laughs> 